Hi folks, good people of Erskine Parish Church and whoever else happens to be joining us on our YouTube channel, uh, welcome. This is a little bit of a different video from the Sunday broadcast. Um, there's so much that happens at church. It's not just the formal worship, it's the uh, chatting to each other and staying in connection and communication. And we can't do all of that the way we normally would. But I thought um, it would be a nice idea to go some way to alleviating some of the separation and isolation to provide as regular as I can just a little uh, video update of what's going on with um, either myself and family, um, a bit of church news, that's what I'm going to do tonight, a bit of family news, a bit of church news um, and then I've just got a really short devotional, um, nothing like the Sunday sermon um, to, to walk through towards the end. Um, it's now a good number of weeks since I've seen really any of you um, and I, I think that's what I find the hardest about this is just missing that interaction on the Sunday, the catching up, um, hearing how you and your families are doing. My family and I in the manse have been doing okay. Um, we had a spell of some coughs and colds. We, none of us had any of the symptoms though that we thought were consistent with coronavirus so none of, none of us have been isolating in any way but it was just a kind of really unpleasant and lethargic uh, cold runny nose type cold that we all had. I, I had a couple of days in bed with it last week which is um, why I was a bit quieter even on the electronic communications front than usual. I managed to recuperate enough though to get the Sunday sermon done so that was great. Um, we're all mostly recovered now I'd say and um, fighting fit although just uh, very much having to adjust and get used to a different kind of life and pace of life, the same as everybody else in the country at the moment. Um, having said that, I think everyone's making a good effort at it. Um, we've all got our own stages of life that we've got to kind of be sensitive to. So Finley's busy homeschooling uh, with his mother. Fortunately, she's a <clears throat> an ex-primary teacher, so... Um, for such a time as this, it seems she's got those skills and they've actually been getting on really well and Finley's been making pretty good progress um, despite being at home and being out of his normal environment. He's been pretty excited about not having to wear a uniform every day. Um, the twins, my goodness, that has been a job keeping them entertained um, during the lockdown. It's pretty limited what any of them are, are able to do. Um, we kind of limit going out for any walks really either because just with the social distancing rules we have done uh, we've done one as a family but um, try and pick very quiet times it's not easy to completely contain all of them with the age and stage that they're at but the twins have been enjoying doing um, video exercises actually on finding YouTube videos I don't know how what this quarantine would have been like um, before YouTube and the internet more broadly it's just been pretty amazing, really, that you're able to just... Yeah, there's there's an endless, almost an eternal stream of stuff to hopefully entertain them. But I guess one of the side benefits and blessings is we've just had a bit more family time, a bit more time together to do things, to read stories and watch movies and um, play games together. Victoria has a um, super keen baker. She's had lots of time for that, although the, the, the shortage, the run on national run on self-raising flour has been unhelpful um, It's and she was pretty near despairing wondering if there was ever going to be self-raising flour again but um, we got some today and she's managed to get stuck back into the baking. In terms of church news um, there's been an amazing effort locally in our skin the joint task force that was put together basically a mix of all the churches in our skin as well as the community council um, the Rotary Club, some other community organisations and we had a very long initial planning meeting to figure out how we were going to best serve the community and it's just been wonderful to see an army of volunteers come. We um, worked to put together, pay special credit to um, Jackie Reed of the Community Council, it's been fantastic as has um, Matthew down at the Salvation Army at really um, organising, coordinating the whole thing. 
we printed a whole bunch of leaflets so there could be a mass leaflet drop to to every house in Erskine. That was the aim um, to let people know to get in touch with a kind of centrally planned committee in order that then they could be served with whatever they need, whether it's care packages, phone calls, um, food if if they need that. Um, the response has been great, um, really great uptake, and also the the community has just been so generous and. In donating not just things, um, food, but also money, and wanting to raise money to support the effort for as long as this needs to last. Um, so we we at the hub as well have been able to donate some of our kind of stock that's obviously not getting used just now um, to that initiative, and they've been really grateful for that. So um, yeah, the hub has just been such a blessing, and I'm just so grateful to the people who work and volunteer at that and have kept it so well run and managed so that we're able to do something like this at a time like this, even though we're not able to open the hub as normal, um, which is so unfortunate. There's uh, also the issue of our situation with what we continue to do with church. Um, We're coming up to Easter, and I think this will be the strangest Easter possibly in the history of the church in in so many ways, particularly in our experience, maybe for a hundred years or so anyway. It is just so surreal. Um, and so obviously I had planned to do a bit more around Holy Week. Um, it's going to be much more stripped back. I'm going to, as much as I can, keep the... I planned out my texts, my sermons um, and the books I was going to preach through for the year so I'm going to stick to that as closely as I can so um, we're going to have a couple of weeks of build up to Easter um, thinking on the theme actually of Jesus coming as as king Um, so it'll have some overlap with what we studied in the covenants and then after Easter we're going to move move into the book of James hope to um, preach through the the whole book of James um, bit by bit so that'll be coming up after Easter and it looks almost certain we're still going to be in um, quarantine, lockdown, whatever you want to call it, um, till then. Um, I just, I did want to draw your attention to one thing. We, um, there's enormous challenges in keeping the church going just now and there's enormous challenges for every sector of society, whether it's the, the small business Even larger businesses, um, travel, tourism are really struggling, third sector, but um, we're we're not immune to that. And a huge part of how we keep ourselves going is our weekly gatherings and meeting and people giving their offerings. And that contributes to the work that we do, contributes to our um, outreach, contributes to everything. Um, And so obviously that's not what it used to be at the moment where we were not able to have so many people in our congregation they love to be able to come and drop off their envelope and um so it's to draw your attention to a couple of things there was a congregational letter that went out saying um, we've offered a service where you can contact someone to come and pick up if you wish uh the envelopes and um if not if you want to move to giving by bank order bankers draft um those forms put out with that later but we have more if you want to request one and then there's also um, a new section on our website we're trying to make things as easy as possible because we know for so many people what they love about church and what they love to do in terms of their um, responding and their worshipping is just giving Um, so we've put a section on our website where it's got the details of um, our, our bank account details so you can do a direct bank transfer um, if you want to be able to do that while we're in this sort of lockdown situation. Um, and that's it for church news. And I was really encouraged. I've been actually really encouraged by some of the feedback that's come in from the online services. It's um, been really heartwarming to see that despite the fact we're so stripped back and so much of what we love to do has been um, pared back that it's still communicating, it's still connecting, that the gospel still is powerful and um, God is still able to speak to you even through these methods and means. So that's just been enormously encouraging and helpful to me. 
it's been even more helpful just hearing specifically how the sermons are connecting with you, whether it's through comments or email or whatever. Um, and I even had some people saying that they're they're doing multi-group Skype chats after the services to do what they normally do in the hub after, to meet up and Skype and chat about the sermon. And so, yeah, that's great. I'd encourage you to do that if you haven't given that a go, if you want to feel like you have some sense of that community and um, I, I'd love to hear if maybe there's more of you doing it. I'd love to hear about it and hear how you're getting on, how you're keeping some semblance of church going in these times. I, uh, I've i been myself meditating on Psalm 107 uh, really since the start of this, since probably the week before we had to look at really um, closing church and starting to lock down. I've been thinking about it and it's a, it's a wonderful psalm but especially from verse 23 onwards i'm sorry for the noise by the way but um th- this is locked down and there's there are no soundproof rooms in this month um psalm 107 from verse 23 <clears throat> some went out on the sea in ships they were merchants on the mighty waters They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunkards. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm. And he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks unto the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise his name in the council of elders. Amen. This is a really powerful psalm. It's actually a beautiful poem that the writer draws on a number of different images um, in order to show a bit more, sketch out what God's salvation is like and in a way what God's salvation feels like. Um, he's drawing on the idea of being rescued from something where you're sure you're, you're going to perish and you're in huge trouble um, and then that sense of relief when when you finally know things are going to turn out okay whether it's being released, released from prison or wandering in, in a desert hungry and thirsty and and then getting fed um, and then this image I, I really like this one maybe it's um, just growing up on an island and being reminded of the the power of the waves and the sea and how there's there's beauty in it but there's also great peril and danger and that and that's certainly the backdrop to probably what any ancient writer i mean this psalm may well in some sense be drawing on images from israel coming home from exile but um the sea was also a harboring it of of chaos and often death for the ancient writers and the ancient thought world in fact the sea was thought to just contain um utter darkness and chaos and it, it's quite often a symbol for chaos and death in the bible um even some of the imagery we have at baptism a lot of that is the idea behind it it's going down into death and then being being raised again to life and that certainly seems to be in the mind of the biblical writers and here we have um, sailors and so if, if if the waters represent a sort of unknown deep chaos where you you can't fathom it and you can't control it the writer is making you picture yourself as these sailors um, tossed about in the middle of that and it's interesting because some of the other images in the psalm there are um, about the fact that the people are not right with God, that they're sinners and that they they desperately need um, his salvation and his forgiveness in order to get them to be right with God again. And it's really interesting because this image is looking at a different aspect of salvation. So salvation is, of course, it takes in forgiveness of sins, but the salvation and the gospel is so much bigger and so much fully orbed than that. Um, 
it's dramatic in that sometimes it just lets us know not so much of our guilt. I love the way um, Jerry Kidner, the Bible commentator, speaks of this portion. And he says that it speaks not so much of our guilt, but of our littleness. Of our littleness in the world and the fact that we don't live in this world and exist by good management and just with how um, carefully calculated all our decisions are and how in control we are. We actually, uh, the picture this little poem gives, that we live by divine permission and it's by the gracious hand of God that we live. And life is much more like this than we would like to admit and I think I've been meditating on this picture just now because what's going on in our world with the coronavirus, it's a dramatic reminder of our our littleness. Even with the unbelievable technology and medical science that we have and how much we're able to extend and prolong life, how much we're able to cure and alleviate disease and something comes along and in some sense it causes more chaos than a war. It causes more um, economic upheaval in many ways and job insecurity or certainly just as much. And it's just a tiny little virus, but our, all our systems and all our achievements can be brought to a standstill very quickly. And we find ourselves like the men in the psalm, like people in the midst of a storm, crying out, realizing that we are not the master or the captain of our own destiny. And so in our littleness, we desperately need to look to God. We need his hand to still these waves around us. And it's funny, I think it's one of the things I'm more keenly aware of is it's watching this crisis as a pastor and I suppose as a kind of a low level theologian, I guess you could say. But you're always looking and hoping for that crying out to come into society. It's it's one of my prayers through all of this that Um, People who lead our culture and whether that's in politics and government or um, in in media, that they would realise actually that that we need God. And that uh, all the edifices we're able to create that make us feel secure, that that ultimately we, we are not in control on the level that God is. And we actually desperately need him more than anything to intervene in these situations. Now, I I don't make a, a, a an overly sharp distinction between um, the work of God's grace and goodness as seen in the development of um, whether it's medical tests or vaccines or cures. I'm, I'm perfectly content to say that God can and does work through all those things in what seems incredibly ordinary to us to make life better and to show his goodness and grace um, to the watching world. Um, And I'm also equally comfortable with the way Jesus comes in the New Testament and still storms completely supernaturally, 100% by overriding all the natural laws um, of our world and how they work. And and God can do anything, and I think it's false to to pigeonhole him into either one of those categories and say he must and he can only work in that way. I think I find this psalm and this part of the psalm interesting and comforting because I think it causes us to be cautious. Um, I've seen some rather alarming... um, I guess you could say second guessing of of what this coronavirus might be all about within religious circles, within Christian circles, and and some of it attributing it to a very clear judgment from the hand of God. Um, Now, if you read all through your Bible, especially your Old Testament, and and even in this psalm, that's, that's definitely part of the picture. God can and does judge your world and he will judge it finally that's what he's coming back to do when when jesus returns and so it's it's integral to who god is is to judge um wickedness and evil and he can 
what I guess I'm lacking in all of that is either the prophetic insight personally um, or the part in scripture that very clearly says that the coronavirus in 2020 is, is a direct judgment from God and that's how we ought to read it. I'm just extremely cautious and reserved about saying that because I just I personally don't feel I would have the, the evidence to be able to say that, that it's clear enough. And I think that's actually the picture the Bible gives when you look at um, the way God, a uh, good example would be Job. Job is suffering so much and he suffers and he loses everything and then he pursues his case with God and he gets his audience with God and he, he protests his innocence and the fact that it shouldn't have happened to him. And, and it's interesting, God doesn't really give him any reason. Um, God doesn't feel the need to vindicate or justify himself as the creator to one of his creatures. And he just doesn't ever give Job the answer for why evil, why suffering. All he does is, in a way, pull back the curtain and show a little bit of who he is and how great and mighty and powerful he is. Um, how awesome and terrible he is in many ways. And I actually can't help but feel that that is really where the global pandemic is leaving me and, and I hope it's it's a worshipful and it's a good place to be is is in awe of God and reliant on his pity and his mercy and rather than trying to answer inscrutable questions and try and um, draw a line between certain effects in the world and where God might be as the cause and the line is is to do what we're called to do in all circumstances and, and worship him and that doesn't mean we don't wrestle with it and we don't pray and hope for an outcome and a cure and for God to intervene dramatically I think all that is what we should be doing um, but I find it interesting that this little passage that's been the mini poem that's been ministering to me it, it doesn't say that the sailors were guilty doesn't attribute that to why they find themselves in a storm. I think if this teaches us anything, it's that life does have storms. And we're not always sure where they've come from or even why. And um, you ask any sailor, the weather can change so unbelievably quickly that it's frightening out in the open seas. And that can be the way life feels. I mean, who of us thought four weeks ago this would be our norm in our existence? The storm comes almost without fail. And it's more of a question of who do we cry to in the middle of the storm? Who, who do we trust ultimately to, to get us out, to help us through the storm? Um, one of the books I'm really reading, and enjoy, I've got it here actually, reading and enjoying is um, a book by an academic fellow named um, Kevin Van Hooser. It's called Hearers and Doers. And it's, um, it's all about discipleship and how we become what James says, hearers and doers of the word. People who hear it, but don't go away and forget it, but then practice it. Really, it's his manual for discipleship. And Kevin's an excellent writer, very thought-provoking, nice style. And he's been reflecting a wee bit on some of the gods in, in our culture, if you like. And he wrote this, obviously, before the current pandemic, but I'm finding it deeply relevant just now because he talks about the gods of um, our health and well-being and wellness culture. And he's he's a very careful thinker, so he's careful to say that obviously, you know, diet and exercise are good and well-being and health are good. Uh, and all these things are actually good and, and to be used well because they're, they're glorifying to God when they're used well. But when they cross over... Um, when they become more than that, uh, th they're like anything that becomes an idol. They, something that we hope in to deliver us and give us all our meaning and our satisfaction in life. They become very destructive. Um, and he draws on the likeness of uh, Salus, who was the ancient Roman goddess of, of basically that, of well-being, of health and wealth and happiness. And he was showing how our culture is actually quite Full, it's gone full circle. It's quite pagan in many ways because although we don't um, officially worship a pagan ancient god called Salus, 
we 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 might as well in many ways in our culture we you know we we trust in our culture of well-being and longevity and of life and and the advances we're able to make as 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 our ultimate meaning and and he was saying that probably the one of the most um perhaps if you like depressing things in our culture and civilization is that our goal so often is is just to preserve just to prolong life just just to live in this world just that wee bit longer if we could get 10 years onto it maybe even 10 years with a bit more of a quality existence and that's it i think that's a good goal and and, and he seems to as well but is that it is is that what we're alive for it doesn't seem like that's big enough in and of itself to give us an enormous amount of purpose I, I remember this actually struck me when i was i was a teenager and it was one of my old art teachers um back in high school and and he was uh, he was a really interesting fellow and he was asking us one day what's the most important thing in the world guys you know in your life what's what's the most important thing and we all gave various answers and um, I can't remember what any of it answers were. I just remember his, you know, it was a rhetorical question in a way, and he was trying to get to the point of um, his his answer to the question. And he was saying at the end of the day, he said, it's it's your health. He said, it's your health. If you don't have your health, that's it. You're stuffed. You don't have anything. So you just need your health above all else. And, you know, I I wasn't a Christian at the time, but I'd been raised in the church, and I, I had a lot of that worldview. And I remember thinking... Even then, you know, I must have been about sixteen. I remember thinking, that seems a little bit, uh, a little bit depressing. Actually, is is that it? Because then, what does that say about people who don't have health? What does that say when we're threatened with with losing our health? How far is that able to take us? Um, how far is that able to sustain a meaningful vision for our own lives, even? If it's just health, because there's so many people, in fact, there's so many people who don't have whatever, however you would categorize or describe health, whether that's mental health or, or physical health and ability, that maybe don't have a measure of those things and live deeply meaningful lives. There are, pe- there are people who have achieved incredible feats for the kingdom of God and the gospel, while in many ways deeply unhealthy in, in many ways. Now, the other side of that coin theologically is that, you know, I think ultimate health and wellness and well-being, you know, the, the word you often have for this in the Bible is the Hebrew word um, shalom. And it's it's a grand word and it takes in that sort of idea of complete wholeness in every dimension of life and, and of experience and of um, well, the universe really is it's shalom is, is what the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth um, are are going to be that that God is actually bringing about through Jesus Christ and His kingdom. So this is not to say that it's good in any way to be unhealthy. It's just that in this period between Jesus' first and second coming, for that to be the goal of our lives and what we live for. It somewhat stops short, I think, of God's vision for our lives. And in times like this, it would be like the sailors in this little poem, um, tossed in the middle of the sea, that all their hope and all their faith is in uh, calm waters, is in quiet waters. And I think the point that the psalmist, and I'm thinking of the psalmist as a whole now, is that If you get quiet and still waters that God leads you beside, good and well, they are a gift, but they they are not the God. They are not the giver. Um, Any good experience is it comes, and that's what I love about the perspective of the psalmist. They see that that we have no good thing outside of God. That ultimate goodness, any fragment of that shalom, um, if we're going to find it, then... We've got to find it in God and be satisfied in, in, in God. I think that's what Jesus was getting at when he said that man, repeating the Old Testament, that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That in order to have meaning and, and real satisfaction in life, that we need to feed on a lot more than just 
a, a hope or a vision for, for some health or some wealth or whatever it might be um, in, in this temporal existence in life. Rather, we want to be people who know uh, Yahweh, the God who is the, the Lord and Savior, who can be called out to and who is in control over all circumstances because we can't change the circumstances. We can't affect, this is what this crisis is showing us in so many ways, we can't affect the outcome or circumstances of so many things, far less than we could ourselves on about actually from day to day. But if we're in the relationship with God of all control, who, who is sovereign and in control over the entire creation, then then even if we don't get the, the benefits and the blessings, even if things don't go our way, then we know ultimately that we are cared for and in, in relationship with a God and know the name of a God who has our good at heart and has given us a purpose in in bringing eventual shalom to the creation and, and and so whatever part we get to play in that just now however limited and however fraught with trouble because trouble over the storms always come then we're, we're able to handle that we have a vision for being for our lives that's bigger than just temporal circumstances and a, and a, a fleeting bit of um, wealth or peace or prosperity or whatever here and there it's actually our life is is nestled in the in the grand purposes of what God is doing and so the purpose that we live for or couldn't be bigger and and the God that we're in union with couldn't give us a more secure footing um, for our lives so those are my thoughts on Psalm 107, it's been really blessing me, and these verses have been um, over these last few weeks. I hope they're a blessing to you too, and um, I hope this was helpful. Um, I hope it was good to get a bit of an update, and please do get in touch by uh, my all my details, my email, my church work phone, all that are on our various forms of communication um, between the website and the Facebook and um, there's comments now on YouTube so please get in touch if you get any feedback anything else you'd maybe like in terms of the videos um, while we're doing these broadcasts and um, even just to say hello so okay bye god bless